for this our service of worship for the 13th of June. I'm sure that you will agree that we have been blessed this last week by the turn in the weather. Hopefully this also reminds us that we can give glory to God for all of his provision. For we need both the rain and the sun in order to flourish. Jesus frequently referred to such things in his teaching and the parables that we will hear this morning are no different. These also speak about how God in his provision gives us all that we need exactly when we need it. And we will not know how it happens, merely that we do eventually see the fruit in the harvest. Since on another level, Jesus is not talking about earthly provision at all, but of how God is ordering the whole nature of the universe and the extent of his rule in his creation. We can also draw hope and assurance from this same parable. God will bring all things into completion in the fullness of time. The conditions for how this happens need not be known to us. In the same way as a seed grows, whether the farmer is asleep or awake. So even in these last and most difficult years, and in the face of continued uncertainty, we can trust that God is bringing his kingdom to bear in the world, to redeem the world, and to transform it forever. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign, and though we may not know all the conditions that bring about the growth of your kingdom, you are always causing it to grow, whether we see it or not. Thank you that you have invited us into this kingdom of grace and power and love by the death and resurrection of your own Son, Jesus Christ, and by our faith in him through your Holy Spirit. To you be all glory, now and forever. Amen. We come to our confession. To the words, Lord, have mercy. Please respond, Lord, have mercy. And similarly with Christ, have mercy. Creator God, you have made the world so wonderful, but we do not always respect your work. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, our Saviour, you speak to us through your word and through creation, but we do not always pay attention. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you offer hope and life that we too often sit in apathy and despair. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O living God, we who are partly living, scarcely hoping and fitfully caring, pray to you now to make us fully alive. Give us the vitality, awareness and commitment we see in Jesus Christ through the power of his death and resurrection. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, you have taught us that all our doings without love are nothing worth. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true bond of peace and of all virtues, without which whoever lives is counted dead before you. Grant this for your only Son, Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 34, to chapter 16, verse 13. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gabir of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again till the end of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Simar pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The reading is taken from Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself the first stalk, then the head, and the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of the seeds on earth, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its, sh- in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Good morning. I am reading one of Marjorie's sermons today. I think this is the last time that I will be reading one of Marjorie's sermons to you. 
um, as at the end of this month she um, uh, stops for a while ministering within our parishes and takes a well-earned rest uh, and pause from her ministry. Uh, and I'd like to say thank you here to her for her faithfulness and for always providing me with such interesting sermons to read. She writes, Our New Testament reading today gives us two short parables and ends with this declaration. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He didn't speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. But why? Why so many parables in Jesus' teaching? To begin with, it was a traditional form of teaching, one that was tried and tested. There are parables in the Old Testament, and it's a form from other cultures too. Aesop's fables, they're not religious, were very moral little tales with a lesson. And stories are a great way of hooking people. Everyone loves a good story, so it's going to get and hold people's attention, much more than a long list of facts or a lecture on ethics. Stories, too, are a good way of getting under the skin, of teaching someone a lesson in what's a pretty sneaky way, really, when they don't always realise it. Think of Nathan and David, after David has slept with Bathsheba and then arranged her husband's murder. Nathan showed David his guilt and brought him to acknowledge it simply by telling him the story of two rich two men, a rich man with many flocks and a poor man with one beloved ewe lamb. When the rich man entertains a guest, he takes and kills the poor man's lamb and serves it for a feast. David is furious and demands that the rich man be punished, not realising that he is condemning himself until Nathan points it out. You are that man. Parables are the Bible's stealth technology. And parables provide us with teaching in an accessible language. Not many of us are theologians, far less so than the first century Jews who attended synagogue and knew their Old Testament so well. But for even the greatest Bible scholars, some divine concepts are intrinsically beyond human imagining. So Jesus takes familiar parts of life that his audience could see around them every day. Birds, plants, animals, things they understood and could relate to, and use them to point to something beyond. A parable is often called an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, which is not a bad definition. And that is entirely appropriate when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God, as he does in the parables here. We will never fully grasp the total significance of what the kingdom of God is, even though we pray for it daily as we say the Lord's Prayer. Jesus' teachings seem to acknowledge that it can never be fully described or explained. So he gives us a series of vignettes. He doesn't say the kingdom of God is this or is that. He says the kingdom of God is like this. Rather than attempt a full description, he gives us some characteristics. And the two parables here that relate to the kingdom are typical of his approach. Jesus uses organic images, a growing seed and a mustard seed, to explain how the kingdom grows and expands. The first image is of a seed sown, almost forgotten. Nature takes over. The seed lies in the ground, sprouts and emerges, grows to full maturity and yields grain. Then someone comes along, perhaps the one who sowed it or perhaps another, and reaps the harvest. Like the sower, we cannot make the seed grow. We can only scatter the seed of the gospel. But if the seed is good when it is sown, nature will take over. The only thing to stop it growing is if we leave it in a bag in the storeroom and don't bother to plant it. A healthy seed cannot fail to grow. That is what it's designed to do. And if it's planted in the rich soil of God's love, it will yield a harvest. Like the sower, we don't see the development. We don't see the process in the soil that goes on in the darkness while we sleep. But we do see the harvest. Of course, we have a duty of nurture and care. Responsibility doesn't end with the sowing. But the message of the parable seems to be that if we are faithful in the sowing, the seed will grow in spite of us, 
seen and overseen only by God, who brings forth the harvest in his own time. So if that is how the kingdom grows, the parable of the mustard seed foretells the end result. Imagine a seed in your hand, how small and tiny, seemingly lifeless, and yet it is capable of producing something hundreds, thousands of times bigger than the seed itself. Jesus chooses the tiny mustard seed to make his point, because the tree it produces can be huge, not particularly tall, but very broad and wide-spreading. The tree spreads its branches across a great expanse, and it casts a very wide shadow. And if you think of the early church, that's a great analogy, because the kingdom, the church, grew and spread enormously in those early years. Not only was it a flourishing growth in and of itself, it spread its shadow across the known world until it could be resisted no more and was adopted by the Roman Empire, which to many at the time was their whole world. And it has continued to grow until it's embraced the whole of our known world. And so taken together, these parables show us how the kingdom grows and the extent of its growth. What they don't say is that first the seed must die and then begin new life. And that, of course, is the core truth that underpins any analysis of the kingdom of God. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ which provides the seed, the seed that we grow. It's, then, it's when we plant that knowledge, that seed in the hearts of men, that the sown seed will grow. For the seed is good and grows, not because of us, but in spite of us. Looking round, we might be tempted to despair and think the church is on the way out. But that's not the global picture, or the picture in God's sight. All over the world, the Christian church is thriving and growing. And that new life is coming, even to Bridge North, even in Shropshire. So let's continue in hope to sow the seed, and pray to God our Father to bring the harvest. Amen. We declare our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the God of heaven and earth for the growth of the kingdom. May the kingdom grow in clusters of Christians all over the world. May it grow as hearts are warmed by encounter with the living God, nourished by word and sacrament, private prayer and public worship. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow in states, empires and monarchies. 
in the crowded streets of cities and in the scattered rural communities, in all decision-making and all spending. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow in every human shelter and home, every place of work and education, in each conversation and in our mutual care of one another. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. May the kingdom grow to bring peace and healing wherever there is pain or sadness to bring reassurance, comfort, courage and hope. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. In the knowledge that we must all face judgment, we pray for those who have died, thanking God for his loving mercy and entrusting our loved ones to God's safekeeping. Lord of heaven, let the kingdom grow. As we thank God for all his blessings to us, we offer him the rest of our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for joining us for our service today. We pray that you will be blessed and enabled to do justly, and empowered to tell others of the joy of God's kingdom and the freedom of Jesus Christ, wherever you may be. So the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always.